You're welcome back. Right now, we're going to take this short moment that we have to look at improving intelligence and stopping attacks on military police. And we're glad to be joined this morning by Reverend Hayab, uh, who will be who is the president of Khan in Kaduna State. Uh, good morning and welcome to the program, Reverend. Thank you very much. Good morning to our viewers and morning to you in the studio. You yeah, may want you. to also add that Reverend Hayab is a security expert. Mm, yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. I, well, I, I missed that. Um, well, it's good to have you. Well, we, I have experienced this thing that happened in River State. Uh, River State DPO was uh, attacked and killed by cultists. But the experience I had also was a classmate of mine who was serving somewhere in the southeast was beheaded. And his head was kept on his body and they wrote there that he's, he's too troublesome. He troubles the bandit so much so that uh, they will deal with him. Now, bandits can have the effrontery to say things like that about security operatives. They can at attack uh, police stations, they can attack military formations, they can attack anything and anywhere. And right now, we're talking about improving intelligence and all that. First of all, why is it that the intelligence gathering in this country seems not to be top-notch? Yeah, thank you very much. I have said this several times and I'm going to repeat. Uh, first, we have people being recruited into our military and intelligence agencies that in the first place didn't have interest or desire and willingness to be there. They actually just opted for that because there is no job. So because there's no job, they didn't go there to showcase their talent. They didn't go there to improve their talent. They didn't go there to show that they are capable of doing. All they want is something that will end them a living. I've said this, and I want to repeat that. Sometimes if you look at most of those who serve, either in their SSS, the police, CIB, and all other groups, uh, their desire is really not to secure the country. Their desire is not to help the country come out of this security or insecurity challenges, but their desire really is to be closer to a VIP, to guard a VIP. So when they are recruited after training, they will be lobbying friends, they will be lobbying uh, senior people. Uh, can you connect me? I want to be the ADC or I want to be the attaché to one commissioner or to one minister or to anybody who is holding any office. When you have people thinking like that, then you know that intelligence gathering will be poor because the job will not be about gathering intelligence the job will simply be about looking for food finding opportunity to make money and nothing more and then i have also talked about the manner we deploy intelligence we deploy security people in nigeria we still have not really done what is right so when you have that how can you have improved intelligence let me give this example every time that when you think of one bank in Nigeria, just one bank. They do advertise and tell us that they have 1,200 branches. And you know very well that in this 1,200 branches, there are possibly a police or two police in each of the branches. That means the Nigerian police is shot 2,400 policemen just to banks, which they have no one reason to do that. The fact is that the bank is supposed to, on her own, recruit people seek her security, and get the police to train those security, and then they post them to the different branches. But the banks will not want to do that. The banks prefer to take from what we're supposed to be using as a nation to secure their bank, and there is nothing they are remitting to Nigerian Treasury for those services. Purely, they just gratify the DPO, gratify the or improve intelligence. And the larger security men you have are posted to where they're supposed not to be. I just use one bank. You can multiply it with 10 banks. You can multiply it with five institutions or 10 institutions. And you keep going. Then you realize that when we are crying that there is insecurity in Nigeria, we are really not being honest to ourselves because we are the architect of the insecurity. Well, the, just the system in Nigeria, does it, does it permit what you suggested just now, uh, that uh, private security outfits... Uh, be equipped in such a way that they can guard banks, maybe carry guns, and do the things that the policemen in the banks do as well? Our law has nothing against licensed uh, firearms. And the banks have the money to, to acquire one or two. 
Because the simple thing is that they are acquiring a licensed firearm. And there, our inspector general of police and his men can track and know this firearm belongs to Access Bank, GT Bank, UBA, or this, because they license it. So uh, if our laws permit private individuals to have licensed firearm, there's nothing in our law that stops institution from having it. After all, the firearm will only be used within the premises of the bank, not to be used outside the premises. The man is not taking the gun to his house, he's not taking the gun to anywhere, to his, uh, to, uh, to his farm. He simply comes to the office, sign, and is released to him. Once he leaves the office, the next person taking over from him is the one signing to receive it from him. So there is nothing in our laws that stops it. Don't forget, our laws even permit self-defense, but we're talking about firearms, and there is nothing in our laws that is against this. I have confronted one of the IGs in Nigeria in a very serious security meeting, and I explained this. They do agree that truly, this is also an error. But you see, the money that is being made to CPs and big shots uh, is the money that they don't want to compromise and stop it. If not, there is nothing against our laws in what I've just said. Mm. All right, so President Tinubu has made it clear that security fixing uh, the insecurity problem in the country is one of his major uh, focus. And, and we've also had tough words coming from security heads in the country. But in spite of all of this, insecurity persists. In fact, new ways are coming up on a daily basis, almost on a daily basis. You hear of new things happening, people being uh, attacked on their way to work, uh, in our office here, we have experienced a lady on her way to work. She was, the vehicle she entered, she was beaten, pummeled, her eyes rubbed with a, a bunny key and all of that early in the morning. And that's just one of many cases we've heard. Clearly, there is need for new strategies. Being a security expert, what new strategies should this administration be looking at that they have not been looking at, that Nigeria has been overlooking? Because we can't keep reeling out the problems and all the challenges. We need to move forward. How can you have a secure community or a secure society or a secure nation? Well, the larger percentage of the people in the nation are jobless. They are hungry. They are poor. You see, sometimes we talk about security as if it is something you can have police everywhere as long as there is poverty, as long as there is joblessness, as long as there is poor leadership, insecurity will continue to grow. Because by nature, the human mind or the human life needs to eat, needs to meet up certain needs. And if there are no ways to get this need, the temptation is to find an easier and fastest way to do. And that's why crime is growing every day in Nigeria. And those people who commit crimes in the first in the first place start at first. Simply let them steal a phone, let them steal. But gradually they are knowing that people can resist them when they want to steal the phone. So they have to use force. They have to use uh, weapons to hit at their victims so that they will know that they are serious. And then criminals also have realized in Nigeria, not just in the north, but actually in every part of Nigeria, that bandits who kidnappers are making huge money within a short time. Someone who couldn't afford 2,000 naira in the morning, but because he can kidnap someone who will have 50 million in the evening, or we can have 50 million in one week and he has never been to any office. And so they chose that pattern of criminality as a way of making money. You see, it's not just because someone hates somebody or someone is angry with someone or someone wants to kill. The fact of all is that there is serious poverty. Then you talk about the lack of good structure that can address insecurity, the lack of uh, 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 action by government to whoever is arrested should be brought to book and brought to justice. So when you put all these things together, you find that insecurity keeps growing because when people know that they can commit a crime, they can do evil, and no one will arrest them, and even if they are arrested, the seriousness to investigate what exactly they do is not there. Even if they are taken to court, if they have a good lawyer, the lawyer will just look at loopholes in some of the charges against them, and they'll be freed because there's no judge that will just send someone to prison because Reverend Hayab said the man is a thief, or the man is a criminal, or the man is a murderer. Where is the evidence? Those putting together the evidence are, don't do it well, don't do it enough to prove their case beyond reasonable doubt. So criminals go to court and get scores free. And sometimes we'll even accuse the judges, not knowing that the judge couldn't just have sentenced him to prison just because he's been accused. The judge needs proof. Those who are gathering the proof are not doing it well. And I've told you that the good people who are supposed to do this work, their interest, their idea is make quick money, get quick money. That's why a criminal can go to police station 
and buy his way out because money is involved. And the bottom line of it is poverty, lack of lack of provision of what people can meet their needs, and people who are, cannot, uh, people who are not contented, people who want to have it by all means can go into crime to have. So, if we want to address crime in Nigeria, my first advice to Philemon and his team is: Can we deliberately ensure that things begin to work in Nigeria? Mm, okay. services that people need to begin to be available mm. now you have no justification for crime that's one two those who have been arrested let people see that if you are arrested it is no longer business as usual something definitely is going to happen you will end in jail and if the crime is proved beyond reasonable doubt even if it means that you'll be shot you will go once they begin to do it one is in jail two three four five and criminals are beginning to say oh my friend now is in prison and it is no longer the business of yesterday where he will be given a soft landing then every criminal will begin to say hey, wait a minute even you see there are some criminals in nigeria who have been supported by parents supported by relatives because their relatives realize that nobody has ever been brought to book so they will have to support their own as long as it's going to bring money to the house so i believe that the first thing first is we begin to provide services that will even make criminality unattractive. When people now are no longer attractive to criminality, not attractive to evil, then we are beginning to solve security. Then, another aspect that I feel that we've not been doing right is our security, because of this insincerity, have not been able to put synergy between her and the population. The people in the community don't even trust their security, whether they are police, whether they're soldier or whatever. We speak with our mouth that, hey, we are together, they are our brothers, but how much trust do we have? That's why we don't give them good information that will lead them to attacking crime. So the military or the security expert, uh, people must deliberately create an avenue of trust make people believe them make people see them and trust them enough that they can tell them what they know they can tell them what they see then we will begin to address criminality and stop it when we go to judge to judge to the judges sometimes i've had people saying that criminals will go those who are sponsoring the criminals will go behind and speak to the judge and the judge will give those criminals a, a quick bell then when the judges know that it's no longer business as usual they too will sit up so from the security group criminals have no free day from the court criminals have no free day from their relatives criminals have no free day then they will know that the business is over but first what have we put in place to really make people even feel that being a criminal is just a waste of time because you're not going to make it you will end up in jail when we do that honestly we will reduce crime by more than a half but once there are no good services people are hungry you can preach in church preach in mocks you know, Reverend, another thing you said, which I think is quite critical. Want to do something to it. Yeah, another thing you said, which I think is quite critical, is the fact that most of the people recruited into the police force didn't want to be there in the first place. Perhaps yeah. we should be thinking about incentivizing. We should be thinking about making the police more attractive so that people would want to enter there and see it as a noble profession, something to be proud of. And then they would defend, defend see, their uniform. Uh, Defend your uniform and integrity of the force. We run a system in Nigeria called the National Youth Service Corps. For one year, graduates will be sent to schools to teach. Go to these schools and ask them whether these graduates really teach for a whole time. They didn't teach anything. Because the system of posting them sometimes is within when the school is in session. The school cannot be in session for two months and you are sending someone to go and teach in the school. When will he teach for the next exams? He didn't start from the first week of the term. So how can he teach before exams? So we're wasting useful young men. When we make our security attractive, that's another way to get them. Say, look, the first one, that one year mandatory youth service school could be translated into one year security service for your country. You can be posted to the immigration, posted to custom, posted to the police, posted to the SSS, posted to the military, and all the formations that we have. After service, because you were deeply engaged in securing your country, you begin to see the advantage of ensuring your country is protected, your country is secured, your country is rid of crime. When you finish and you feel you want to remain, then you can apply. Mm. You see, we can try this 
I have been to Israel by the grace of God for over 15 times. And I see the young men who stop yeah. me at the airport to ask me questions every time that I've ever been there. These are young men who are coming to do the same program we are doing, a little different, but almost the same program we are doing. And because they are young people, they have the energy, they have the intellect to ask you questions that you can easily give answers that will lead them to another story of 30 years ago. Let me give an example. My name is Haya. There was a crime committed over 50 years ago by somebody called Hayab. I have answered questions about my name Hayab. What is the meaning of Hayab? Why am I Hayab? Have I been to social country and social country? Because their idea is I may belong to the family of Hayabu and have just removed the B that is the last alphabet. And I realized I just love the way they do it. I'm not disturbed at all because of the question. But when you put someone who is already hungry and has no energy to ask those questions, he won't ask further questions, he will interrogate further. He will just so we have many ways we can use our young men and bring them out, and then our country will be secure. The money we are talking about is not just increasing. One governor say I've increased the uh, allowance for, for youth core. We can make youth core an attractive something that everybody will desire to go because it will serve the nation and come up with experience. Listen. In case you serve that one year and chose not to do security work, but he has become knowledgeable in the security of his country throughout his lifetime. Yes, because definitely. Because he will know when there is crime, he will know what is happening. But we are wasting a whole year with our young people calling it a youth call. Yes, of course. Sending a northerner to the south to do a, a, such service and it is about security, and sending a southerner to the north to do that service because security, it also increases their knowledge about the security of our country. So we must go back and look. Yeah, the idea was good and it's still good, but we can modify it and put it to be beneficial to our country and also improving the knowledge of our young people about our country. Then we are also getting young okay. men recruited into the various forces. Let me say this. Do you know that most young men who are recruited into police or army or whatever around this country today, not all of them really pass the exams. Some of them are either nominated by some senior political people. Brother, that man will be actually nominating danger. Okay. Why don't you allow the police to recruit someone who really wants to do the job? All right, so I I'm, I'm higher. To, the army to recruit someone who really wants to do the job, not just nominating because you are a senator. We should stop that about security. Just, yeah. No senator, no person in the executive should nominate anybody to any. Yeah, Reverend Hayab. Uh, well, yes, um, I wish we had more time, but um, it, that's a story for another day. Our IG came into office and said he was feeling like a lion, and uh, people began to call him Lion of the Tribe of Judah. <laughs> that he was going to remove all security men from uh, VIPs and all that, it is not happening. And you just said something that it is uh, the incentives that go to the DPOs, the, the IG, the everybody that is causing it and all that. I, I wish we had more time to discuss, but that is another day. would like to thank you for being a part of our show this morning, Reverend Joseph Hayek. Thank you for having me. And I pray that our country will be peaceful and will be able to improve our security soon. Amen. Okay, that was uh, Reverend Joseph John Hayab, uh, Chairman, uh, Christian Association of Nigeria, Kaduna State, and he also is a security expert talking to us on how to improve the intelligence uh, in our security agencies and make sure that we don't lose security personnel to bandits, to criminals, to everybody that should not even go near them or take their lives. That's how we are going to wrap up, but just before we, we don't go, have a quote of the day. We don't have a quote. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're wrapping up. Join us tomorrow for another edition of The Breakfast. I am Maureen Menomo. And I'm Nyamgul Agaji. Let's do it again tomorrow. Bye for now.